You're listening to the Yeshiva of Newark at IDT podcast. I'm your host and curator, Rabbi Aprom Kivalevich, and I hope you enjoy this episode. You've bought your tickets. The ushers are about to open the doors. Yes, the projection has smicha is about to start. But first, if you own a retail business and accept credit cards, your customers are getting points, miles, and all sorts of rewards every time they use their card. And you're paying the price. That's why NRS Pay, a product of National Retail Solutions, a division of the IDT Corporation, offers its cash discount program, FeeBuster. You can start accepting credit cards for free. If your business processes over $18,000 a month, you pay no monthly fee and $0 out of your pocket for transaction. This means you, as a retailer, can enjoy the benefits of accepting plastic and your customers still get those crucial miles they crave and need. NRS Pay Fee Buster provides every client with a free credit card reader with no long-term contract, no early termination fee, cancel anytime without a penalty. I'm personally familiar with this company, and they truly stand by their product, and they'll help you with live, stateside-based customer service on any issue or question. Visit nrspay.com or call 833-289-2767 to learn more about NRS Pay and the fantastically fair fee buster. Clear the aisles, the projectionist has to meet. Well, we're in the middle of June. This is the month for a lot of activity. People are getting ready for their summers and weddings, uh, June weddings. I know Yitzchuk, uh, we don't want to, maybe we'll, we'll use our little form here to inform everyone, of course, of uh, Yitzchuk is the wedding performer extraordinaire. He could write a book. In fact, I think he's working on a book about all the interesting weddings that he's been a part of and how he's been the key to so much happiness. I, I hope they're happy. <laughs> I hope so. Right. And June, you're right. June, I don't know. June is a pretty solid month for weddings. There's one weekend that I have to block off. I, I use thumbtack.com for most of my wedding leads. And there's one weekend in June that I always have to block off. And that mm-hmm. is Monster Bash weekend. Uh, that, that's what I remember one time I actually had a wedding, but they do the Monster Bash in June and in October. And I had a wedding, I believe, in Central Park in the during the weekend of the October Monster Bash. And my family still uh, never forgave me for missing the October Monster Bash for to, to make a few dollars for wedding. So I now, now I've learned my lesson that we have to block off. The, the weekend of Monster Bash. And, right, and I know this weekend you are going, and it's it's happening uh, in a suburb of Pittsburgh. I think it, it actually it's it's in Mars, Pennsylvania, or yeah, yeah. Mars. Right? And we talked about this, of course, on previous shows, your, how much Monster Bash means to you. and That's where I met Tom Shabilla, who was our guest last week. So yes, he's one of the MCs. Uh, this this coming weekend, none of you have people like the Kolakowski family and and others who love old movies and monster things. But there's it's basically a, a great nostalgia weekend. There are people who have been coming for years and their friends based on these conventions, and not everything there is necessarily monster based. For example, this weekend, uh, as I noted when I checked the website, uh, there's a lot of Boris Karloff, but not necessarily Boris Karloff in his guise as a monster or Frankenstein or Bela Lugosi necessarily as the monster Dracula, but other films and television shows where they were featured. Yeah, one, one very curious one for Monster Bash is they're going to show up Mice and Men because it features Lon Chaney Jr. as, as Lenny. So I, right. I've actually never seen that. I might pick to talk about that next week if i make it through it <laughs> <laughs> yes because the, the the movies and television shows and trivia stuff it's all part of an amazing vibrant uh weekend you know in 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 the era of streaming and everybody just searching for their own little island the fact that you have this ad hoc community that developed around the love of these schlock films and and the fact that they're able to dredge up almost ghoul-like, <laughs> some of the actors and actresses that sometimes just played bit parts in some of these favorite films makes the event uh, an interesting experience and something that it isn't just re- repeating the same uh, rah, rah, rah every time. There's always probably something new and different and something to put in the scrapbook. We have a lot of fun. We 
collect sometimes autographs and uh, take pictures with the, the various guests there, whether, like you said, they might have been the stars, they might have had bit parts, or they might even just be, I, I understand, Bela Lugosi's granddaughter is going to be there this year. Mm-mm. Well, again, don't, 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 again, don't let her give Razi a, a hug and a kiss. Um, you know, you never know if her incisors are are ready to, you know, get some fresh Hasidic Jewish blood. You never know. <laughs> um, so Yitzchak, you actually want to talk about a film that they are going to be showing uh, at this uh, weekend's Monster Bash. Uh, and, and in fact, a lot of the films you've already seen already, part of the fun is watching it again with your friends and and sort of like everybody's saying the same line again. What is the movie that, that you are going to be perhaps seeing this weekend, which is going to be highlighted in the annual Monster Bash? What is the movie? Oh, it, it has a pretty silly name for what it is. And the reason I think they're showing it is because The star of the movie, Audrey Dalton, who was actually born in Ireland, will be one of the guests of honor there. And she's been there before. I think we actually met her before. And I believe they showed the movie there before. This is a movie that I remember seeing on television as a child, but also a lot of people mentioning without perhaps knowing which movie it was. I remember I was, for a few months, I was a chaplain in a nursing home in the Bronx that was actually owned by uh, a Satmar younger man who was younger than me. I remember him as a buffer. And they also, they had another chaplain there who was a woman who was not Jewish, but she was trained by a, a liberal Jewish rabbi and rather interesting uh, character, This uh, an older woman who was a chaplain there in the nursing home as well. And when I mentioned to her something about the monster movies, she said she remembers a movie where there was a little girl and she was in a laboratory and this big monster comes out of some kind of a tub and attacks the girl and the girl is scared and crying. And right away I knew that she was talking about the monster that challenged the world. I think I pulled it up the scene on YouTube and showed it to her and she said, yeah, this, this frightened her so much as a child. And many people have mentioned how scary it was. And looking back at this movie, it really holds up. The title, again, doesn't really make much sense. It was not the original title. The actual original title was The Jagged Edge. And then they were talking about maybe a more, I don't know where that title came from, but the more appropriate second title was The Kraken, although it wasn't uh, one monster. It's actually probably about 10 monsters, according to the story, but you only ever see one at a time. It it sort of has an uh, A-list star, Tim Holt. I mean, you know, Tim Holt was in quite a few films. I mean, Tim Holt, I know, of course, um, I, I believe he was in the Magnificent Ambersons as well. But he was also, he was also, he, which he was almost like the lead in the Magnificent Ambersons. But he was also in, which some people say is the best film of all time. Many people feel that the original Magnificent Ambersons, if we could somehow put it together the way well, the way Wells, uh, Orson wanted it, would be one of the best films of all time. But I remember him, of course as the uh, in a great role in the treasure of sierra madre but he's the star of this film right he's the star he actually was also on stagecoach he was in a lot of movies and he actually came out of retirement he had not been in movies for about five years Um, right he served in world war ii of course he was a he was a bombardier in fact he actually one of the reasons i think he retired is because he actually saw the mushroom club uh, in Hiroshima. So, yeah, I, I guess I guess he maybe wanted to come in to speak about monstrosities. You said synopsis is not your strong suit, but let's let's get this let's get the plot here. Um I'm going to read it if you don't mind. Okay. An earthquake in the Salton Sea unleashes a horde of prehistoric mollusk monsters. Discovering the creatures, a naval officer, I guess that's Tim Holt, and several scientists attempt to stop the monsters. But they escape into the canal system of the California's Imperial Valley, and they terrorize the populace. Very few char- characters are actually killed by these monsters. I think there's uh, less kills than monsters per capita. About nine people get killed by the monsters throughout the movie. But there's another great actor, a uh, great character actor in this movie, and that's Hans Conried. He is, is, plays the scientist in the movie. 
Mm-hmm. Right. And of course, Hans Conrad was, uh, uh, as you say, he's probably been in hundreds of films. One of my favorite things Hans Conrad was in was called Fractured Flickers, which was the same folks who made the Bullwinkle cartoons, took scenes from silent movies and made funny jokes around them. And he hosted them and kind of did all kinds of funny things. But of course, he's very well known for Peter Pan from 1953. Where he played the the voice, he played, Cap, he played Captain Hook, right? Captain Hook, yeah. yes. So he, he was in many shows, many. Yeah, and 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 it, how was his role in this film? What do you think? He's he's effective. Effective, very. He's playing it serious. He's playing a straight role. He's not he's not doing anything goofy or funny as he did in many of his other films. So, and the, and the reason they're so monstrous, not because of radiation like which is the usual trope that uh is done in these monster films but they just i I guess they've been there since since the dinosaur age since the prehistoric age right it appears there is some mention of radiation perhaps waking them up but not being responsible for for them being so big meaning they always were that big i i guess is what the way it's presented Uh and and basically these drama of the film is how are we going to uh stop these mollusks what are we going to do to eradicate them to kill them and once again it's sort of the military tim holt representing the everyman the the blood and guts you know gumption american that he always played and he's working together with the scientists or uh, at odds with them no it seems everyone's working together the characters are fairly well developed you know you have a, a single mother and you have you know different the, the women aren't played in any kind of a sexist way they're respected so all in all characters are above average it's not a brilliant great film but as far as a 50s sci-fi movie it has two things going for it one is as we mentioned the, the characters are better than a lot of others the acting is above average although there is are some kind of silly scenes but for the most you know unintentionally funny scenes but for the most part they're pretty well done but the, the thing I, I, I really- have to mention one of the people who who is uh i guess serving under uh lieutenant uh holt you know commander john twilliger i guess what his name is uh in the film uh is joel mccray's son who right. who really as uh you know he's not exactly the spitting image of his dad but uh, jody mccray would you say uh, it's called that had this been made during an era like like when Poltergeist was made, when you know during the eighties, uh, when special effects were you know just becoming like Lucasfilm was able to really with CGI and other things really create a more believable looking monster that the film would have been a more effective one. I, I think they actually look much more threatening than any actual mollusk. If you you know the maybe the poster doesn't do all the all that it could for it, but if you actually see the movie. It looks pretty much very more like something you would expect out of the 80s, especially as far as animatronics. That's what they really are. They're animatronic. Mm-hmm. Pop. They're not presented, even though in one of the trailers at the end, it's presented as some kind of, you know, giant, you know, size of Godzilla. But the actual size of the monster is, you know, something about maybe 12, 15 feet long, not humongous and, and not really even so difficult to kill. but something that multiplies quickly and could be a threat that would probably what would be the challenge but it's not really they don't really challenge the world they they somewhat inconvenience uh southern uh, you know a small part of southern california but they are quite scary looking there are some pretty good jump scares especially as far as a 50s movie in many ways this movie is more ahead of its time and has some aspects that are, I would say, are more along the lines of uh, the this the style of special effects would fit, I think, more in the eighties than in the fifties. Mm-hmm. It's that's interesting that some of the again, obviously, you know, taste and as we say in in, in Hebrew, you know, but there are there are people who felt the film is very talky. And that we only see the monsters like ten percent of the time. Yeah, that's, and, that's, that's probably the biggest problem. When the monsters are on screen, the monsters are very good, but you don't see them as much as you could. But right, there's the, a lot of talk supposedly. Yeah, but, but the talk is actually, it's not like how you know in the Godzilla movies there always was a lot of talking. 
and it was kind of boring. These characters are and and kind of silly and hokey. Here you have talk, but it well developed, interesting characters. Maybe not such a dramatic, you know, conflict or anything, but the the monster is definitely the high point of this movie. The the mm-hmm. monster, the special effects, and it's not done by Ray Harryhausen or anything else. It's not it's not anyone who I familiar with doing anything else but it's I, really I saw that fact. most of the reviewers think it's got that the underwater sequences are done very well yeah so you basically what you're saying is this is an overlooked semi-classic uh it's got some it's got it's worthwhile i i don't know what tim holt i think this might have been one of the last films tim holt did um yeah. Only so, one or two after that yeah so it, it's if you're a tim holt fan and tim holt had, gone, had a very interesting career in hollywood it might be something uh that you'd be interested in seeing and as you say uh you know Conrad is, <laughs> hans conrad is, is a lot of fun obviously he's um toned down here but still he's still hans conrad <laughs> mm-hmm. the is really the high point yeah hans conrad yeah you know he's um i i didn't mention him the other day but one of the things that i saw him recently and that we talked about on this platform was his role in a davy crockett he actually plays one of the heroes who becomes like a hero in the alamo yeah that was actually uh you know he starts off as a as a sort of slimy gambler and uh when he realizes what's going on and the heroism around him he decides to 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 actually die as a martyr along with everyone else in the Alamo. So that's another Hans Conrad little acting thing. And he actually uh, brings some humor into it. And, you know, I mentioned the Bullwinkle cartoons. He actually also played Snidely Whiplash in Dudley do So Ah, so he was the voice of Snidely. I yeah, I see. didn't know that. I mean, now, now, that, now that it's mentioned, now that I looked it up, I realized, yeah, that's him, <laughs> you know. Who else yeah. could it be? Yes, well, well, Snidely, it was, you know, if we talk about Bullwinkle, I mean, we could we could do a whole show here about Bullwinkle. You know, one of my favorite, favorite all-time programs. You know, yeah, uh, every, every aspect of the show to me was was pure perfection. Pure perfection. <laughs> whether it was Sherman and Peabody or whether it was um, Fractured Fairy cool. Tales. I, I, I Probably Dudley do right is probably in many ways, the most off the wall parts of the show. Although many people think the Boris and Natasha stuff, but if you if you if you see the way the characters talk in uh, in Dudley Do Right, the types yeah. uh, the types of, of 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 endings that occurs, Dudley and his horse, Nell. I mean, it's so you know, you know Nell's father. It's just every character there. It's such a send up of the Mounties in Canada. You know, I would say that, uh, you know, it's it's a send up of old Hollywood and Nelson Eddy and Jeanette McDonald. And yeah, if that's all Hans Conry did, that would already be an impressive. He appeared a few times in Gilligan's Island. He appeared. In- yeah, look, he was in the, he was obviously, you know, a character actor with a lot of a lot of stuff behind him. But I don't know if, you know, this is considered, you know, his best one of his best roles. But as you say, it's like uh, something that even if you're not going to Monster Bash, you could probably find it somewhere for free. All the weddings are happening fast and furious. So it got me thinking about love and marriage uh, as I approach my 41st anniversary. And I, I'm thinking about two films. One of them has stayed with me. I saw it a number of months ago and I told uh, uh, Yitzhak and Chava about it. And that is a film that was satirized ruthlessly by Carol Burnett. And, and that's the first time I ever heard about it, which was, it's called Random Harvest. And it stars Ronald Coleman and Greer Garson. It's a 1942 romance, amnesia, romance, weepy type of film that I thought because of the Carol Burnett satire called Rancid Harvest, I, and, 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 and Harvey Corman's mugging and, and Carol's like off the wall Brit. I thought it was probably a stupid, silly film. I had no interest in seeing it. But somehow, when it was playing on TCM, I decided, well, let's check this film out finally. And it blew me away. I really loved the film. And when I, you know, you think about, you know, Warner Brothers had its 100th anniversary. And of course, uh, one of its, you know, the what it, what it emblazoned as its symbol was probably one of the most famous films that Warner's uh, put out was Casablanca. And many people see Bogart. And Ingrid Bergman as the ultimate star-crossed lovers who, who have to sacrifice their love for something better. Hey, look, to me, Bogey 
is such a personality. You don't really see him as a romantic, love-struck human being. He's he he, he just can't play that. And I know he, of course, with Bacall and Key Largo and Into Have and Have Not and, and other films, Bogey to me is too much of a personality to actually be a a lead man lover. Ronald Coleman, on the other hand, in, in a film that was made just a year after Casablanca, really to me embodies the agony of what it means to 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 be in love and sometimes to not be able to feel love, to sometimes be in a relationship where you know it's not working, even though logically perhaps it's something you should go through with. And and this is a film, it's it's very hard to to put a synopsis to it, but basically I'll, I'll, I'll try. It's directed by Mervyn Leroy, who of course is famous, most famous probably for directing The Wizard of Oz. But as far as, you know, I think I've heard that there were a number of hands involved in getting the final direction of, of The Wizard of Oz. The other wasn't just Mervyn Leroy. But this film is about a, a World War I captain who is found without any identifying dog tags like we would have in the American uh, army. And he is found in a sanitarium uh, where he is hopelessly afraid. He doesn't know who he is. He's extremely skittish. Uh, he's been through some sort of uh, PSDD trauma. And, you know, there's a German-like doctor who's who's trying to somehow uh, help him uh, and, and, and cure him in some sort of psychological manner. But he he's lost his memory completely. And, and during some sort of event that occurs outside of this English sanitarium where he's found, he decides to escape. And he ends up meeting an uh, a English dance hall girl played by Greer Garson. And we know Greer Garson won the Oscar, you look, for Mrs. Miniver, uh, I believe was the same year. But I believe, and I've seen Mrs. Miniver, Greer Garson's performance here is tremendous. In fact, again, Bergman, Ingrid Bergman is 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 almost incomparable because of what she's able to convey with her silences and 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 you know, so she is in a league of her own. But acting wise, more is expected from Greer Garson in Random Harvest than Bergman in Casablanca, and more is expected of her than what she did in Miss Min- in Mrs. Mindiver, because she starts off as an English dancehall girl with like the sort of a little bit of a Cockney accent almost. And she's able to discover this lonely, scared fellow. And Coleman is believable, despite the fact that, you know, he radi- usually radiates intelligence and aristocracy and, and, and a certain uh, upper crust aspect. He plays a nervous, skittish person who has lost everything and trying to find himself perfectly. And of course, what happens is somehow they escape and together they form a life and they end up falling in love and getting married and he realizes that he has a potential as a writer. He realizes that he's able to describe things that she has brought out from him, uh, a capacity not only to love, but to appreciate everything in the world and to be able to put it in language that 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 is something new. So he isn't just a, a amnesia victim, but he's actually, because he has been wiped clean by some trauma, he's now able to be brought out and developed into something different. And, you know, they call him Smitty because Smith, we don't even know what his name is, but Smitty and, 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 and the Greer Garson character form this beautiful, loving relationship, caring relationship. And, and they have a child. And then he's on his way, uh, sell a story. Because, you know, one of the he he has been like any struggling writer, uh, he's sending all his his essays and short stories to various places and everyone is being rejected. Finally, there's a newspaper in Liverpool that wants to speak to him and perhaps offer him a job. And it's there, of course, that, again, the trope occurs. It's nothing like the realism that's in Casablanca with Claude Rains and Bogey. But, yes, he he gets hit by a car and incredibly He gets back to the last moment when he had been in the war when he lost his memory, but he, but he, but he doesn't remember anything that it was happening for the last 10 years or whatever, the last six or seven years that he was living as Smitty. And all of a sudden he's back to, and it turns out that he is this incredibly wealthy aristocrat who, who is part to, who lives in this castle like place, uh, with, with, with all these relatives and, 
and he's on the upper crust, the most, most educated and most successful part of English life that he returns to eventually, and with no memory, of course, of his wife and child that he's left in some little English village. And he begins his life again as the head of this huge company and is eventually a member of the House of Lords. In this life, he is he strides like the Ronald Coleman that we know, but he's incredibly missing the love aspect. He's like Spock. He's like somebody who who is just logic, who doesn't have that love aspect anymore, but he realizes he's missing it. It's almost like a, like like the phantom pain of, of of a limb that's been removed that he somehow feels that he maybe should want to love, but he can't uh, when he returns to his family. He uh, encounters everyone there where he's been. And he, of course, he can't tell them anything. He doesn't know where he's been. He doesn't know why he's ended up in Liverpool. But there is a uh, a teenage girl who clearly has a crush on him. It's played by Susan Peters. Susan, unfortunately, had a very short life. She uh, she was, uh, at the making of this film, she was only 20. And she plays 14 till about, you know, 25. And as she grows... Up, she sends letters to, she sends letters to Coleman's character, uh, Charles Rainier. You know, I think that's you know the Rainier, the House of Rainier, and she courts him. She su- tries to seduce him, and in many ways, he should fall for her. She's nubile, she's beautiful. Uh, she doesn't care that he's older, but he can't. There's something about him that she tells, she senses is distant. There's something there that 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 he's lost. And he can't really commit to her and feel anything. In fact, it seems like in that life that he had, everything was basically about efficiency and nobility without real emotion and feeling and sacrifice to another person to the point of 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 giving your life. Now, about 10, 12 years have passed. What happened to uh, what happened to his wife? What happened to to Greer Garson? Of course, who, who, you know, uh, Paula, what happened to her? <laughs> well, she realized, she realizes that he is in the newspapers that Rainier is found. And the psychiatrist, the German guy from the beginning of the film, somehow gets involved with her and tells her that he can't be shocked back, that it would do more damage to him if somehow he found out. And of course, the baby has died. And what she does, and of course, Leroy does an amazing thing here. You don't real you, like you sort of wonder for twenty minutes what happened to Paula. Where is she? And then it turns out in a throwaway scene she comes into uh, like in other words she doesn't enter the like in, in, she comes into the side of the of the frame. She you see her entering as as Rainier's personal assistant who's become his secretary recently. So you you and and the film really you know basically makes you think that why is she doing this, and you discover that she's there to be close to him. She's even though she knows he's somebody else, even sometimes helps enable the relationship with the young girl to continue, even though in her heart this is her husband, but he's been declared dead. <laughs> Smitty has, and, and she hasn't come to the authorities to say that Smitty is Charles Rainier. So she's, in a sense, married him, but she's not. She's trying to be close to him and trying to be just this efficient woman who is the who has to be the paragon of self-control. And meanwhile, she's seeing how her husband, who was her husband, can't love and can't feel. And she's being warned that she still has to remain as stolid. And, 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 and in a way, she becomes a sophisticate. But she yearns for that time of true love and romance that they had together but she she doesn't want to shock him somehow he has to she has to hope against hope that it, it could happen what's 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 incredible here is that as he becomes a member of the house of lords he realizes that he needs to have a wife someone who he can live with and he marries her so they actually get married for a second time in a completely loveless relationship and he tells her look you know, it's not really love, but I really care for you and you're my best friend and I couldn't do anything without you. And and she restrains herself. She's able to have wealth. She's able to wear dresses. She's able to go to balls. She's able to live in this palatial estate. But they're missing 
this this essence and 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 it really again you could as as corny as this sounds it is so engrossing because it really makes you think about what is the marriage about and what is the love and is it possible to be married without love and what can bring out true feeling i mean love is a word that's thrown around so much and so indiscriminately and this film really in its contrast, is trying to sort of get to that, what that point is, and how being able to feel what it can do for you as a human being, and sometimes the sacrifice that being that person is, and by doing this dichotomy between the between the amnesiac and the post-amnesiac is really, in a way, uh, bringing forth what these two qualities now maybe a person needs to have both a person needs to have the efficient aspect of life to be able to be functioning but he also needs to be able to 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 meld that with 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 a romantic obsession with the other person and that's really where you know you you sort of are are, are led along is he ever going to find that and again, another trope comes in, spoilers ahead, he ends up having to go to the city where the sanitarium was, because part of his holdings as this extremely wealthy person is the factory uh, uh, where they're having some sort of riot, uh, where the workers are having a riot. And with his sense of the noble Englishman that we talked about in, in Mr. Cohen Takes a Walk, Rainey or Coleman settles the 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 strike uh, by giving in to the people's demands and when he's there with his with his lackey the guy who works for him his secretary somehow the streets and the and the tobacconist shop and like uh, somehow uh come alive to him henry travers who of course we know as clarence in it's a wonderful life is in this film as well and but the, those last 10 minutes i had tears streaming down my eyes because in a way Paula has almost given up but then she realizes that her husband is back in the place where their love began and will the place and the memory of that place somehow bring him back he carries in his pocket a key to their love cottage and the scene, the last scene, again, spoilers here, how he approaches that cottage with with that key, ready to open the door, and and his memory coming back. Coleman is so perfect. And as he opens that door, you, you realize that Paula is behind him, and she calls out to him, not as Charles Rainier, but as Smitty that she knew. It's just an incredibly perfectly Hollywood ending it doesn't have that many passionate scenes. There aren't any great kissing going on, but you can see the a, a character development. You can see the dependence, the interdependence that we have on the person that we share our life with. And the importance of that choice, it, it, th- there aren't any villains. It doesn't need villains. It, it really, uh, it, it, in, in a way, Again, it could have been a tighter film. There's a little bit of hammy melodrama in it, but I think all of those things can be can be nimchal, as we say. We can forgive them all. So I've waxed on very strongly about this about this film. But if you do want to see a film about love and relationships, maybe you know, you know, I, I really recommend Random Harvest. So <laughs> I guess the common theme here is June. You know the power of June, and if you are having an anniversary, you you could treat yourself to uh, <laughs> the monster that challenged the world, or, or you could you know you could reap the the bounties that is a random harvest. Either one of them will probably go well. If or as, as you say, if you can't be you know if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. Watch your step on the way, everybody. We'll catch you next time. Be well. Good night. Thanks for joining us for another episode from the Yeshiva of Newark at IDT Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a single episode.